Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are tuning in. Thank you so much for joining me today for a voice from the Ever Change Meditation Program. And this will be a Dharma talk on impermanence. Now, this is a way of wrapping up uh, about a month of Facebook Live sessions where uh, we went, I started with a talk on impermanence. Then I think I did four, four guided meditations, three or four guided meditations where uh, I, in the silence of meditation, uh, pointed at different aspects of experience that are indeed impermanent. And gradually uh, embracing more and more of this reality of impermanence, or, or rather I should say, of uh, the impermanent nature of reality. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, actually probably maybe a half an hour more about all of that. <laughs> but before I get into the talk, I do want to make a few announcements. Uh, very excited to announce that I am uh, facilitating an online meditation retreat program. Uh, this is entitled Such Sweet Thunder. Uh, the title comes from a book that I wrote uh, by that same title. It's also, coincidentally, uh, the title of my website, uh, suchsweetthunder.org. And on that website, you can find all of the details uh, for this online meditation program. But just to uh, sum it all up, uh, we'll be starting next Saturday in at the Americas. It'll be Sunday here in Asia, uh, the October 17th or 18th, depending on where you're tuning in from. That's a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, and I'm, for the ease of this talk, I'm just going to uh, talk about West Coast time. How about that? So October 17th on Saturday, we start at 7 p.m. Pacific Coast time. Uh, the sessions are 90 minutes and we'll meet every Saturday evening and Wednesday evening. Uh, again, uh, 90 minute sessions from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Uh, we'll alternate uh, one of those sessions will be uh, mostly guided meditations and a little bit of Q&A discussion. And then the alternate session uh, will be mostly a chat where you can meet with the other participants, compare notes on your experience. I'll be there as well, uh, and it'll be kind of an informal Q&A discussion, and I'll introduce the next chapter and so forth. And we'll be using uh, the Such Sweet Thunder book as a workbook uh, that we'll be working through as the retreat unfolds. So again, that starts on October 17th, uh, this coming Saturday, and it runs through November 14th. And again, you can find all of the sign-up details and so forth on my website, suchsweetthunder.org. Also would like to announce that I'm currently accepting applications for one-on-one -on -one studies online. Uh, so if you would like to uh, begin a meditation study uh, and you're not sure where to start, I love to uh, welcome all beginners. In fact, people from all levels of meditation experience are welcome. Uh, so if you actually have a meditation practice already and you would like to go deeper, I can help you with that as well. Uh, so for more details on uh, the online studies, do go to the website again, suchsweetthunder.org and click on the online studies page that will give you all of the details you need to get started uh, meeting with uh, me as a meditation teacher. Uh, I'd like to also add that um, I often get the question, why do I need a meditation teacher? Particularly with you, you have so many videos uh, for free online uh, and so many resources uh, that you've made available. Why do I need a teacher? Well, when I meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, it gives me the opportunity to tailor the meditation to what's arising in the student's experience. So it's really um, a catered experience. Uh, that is something you can't get from an app, from a phone, or from a video. 
Uh, you can't get that uh, personalized touch. And then in the sessions, we also have time for Q&A. We have time for um, uh, discussion. So it allows me to get a feel for how your practice is unfolding and I can uh, create a meditation practice that best serves your own uh, growth in meditation. Now the next announcement is for uh, my friends and uh, people that I know here in Northern Thailand, where I'm living in Chiang Mai. I'll be, uh, well, I'm very happy to announce, I should say, uh, that I'm going to be at Chiang Mai Holistic, which is a really wonderful healing center. They do Tibetan singing bowl sessions and yoga and meditation and so forth. I'm gonna be there every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, we're doing a loving kindness weekly intensive study group uh, where I'll be offering uh, meditations on loving kindness. Uh, we'll have a talk, a chat and so forth and how we can bring loving kindness uh, to our life and into the world. So if you're here in Northern Thailand, I do hope you'll stop by Chiang Mai Holistic, Wednesdays from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Okay. So let's get started into our talk today on impermanence. Now, you might notice that I'm in another different room, a different location that I've been in uh, in any of my uh, offerings here on, uh, on the internet. Uh, and I'm currently on a retreat, uh, a TRE retreat. If you're not familiar with TRE, it's, uh, it's a technique that's used uh, to uh, bring healing to the body, to the mind, to the heart beautiful uh, uh, therapeutic practice, T-R-E. Uh, you can find all, everything about it on Google if you wish. Uh, and I'm here at the New Life Foundation where I uh, have been the meditation teacher on and off for the past couple of years. I'm just wrapping up my uh, tenure here as we are unfortunately closing due to the COVID uh, situation. So that's why you hear this uh, baritone voice that's kind of rumbling in here. It has interesting acoustic. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk about was this sign here, uh, this beautiful phrase here. Uh, it says, be free where you are. And I'm reading that because I think if you're watching this on my Facebook page or Instagram, uh, it'll be flipped around. So it might be hard to read. That says, be free where you are, and it's in the handwriting of the Zen monk Thich Nhat Hanh. And so uh, we just lost the venerable Thich Nhat Hanh a few days ago. Uh, I believe he was 94. He transitioned uh, a few days ago, actually uh, on the 11th, so I think it was yesterday. Um, when you're on a retreat, you kind of lose track of time. Anyway, uh, so Thich Nhat Hanh illustrating impermanence in his own physical body now. Uh, and oftentimes when people talk about impermanence change, uh, their uh, mind goes right to the practices and meditations and observances of death. Uh, that seems to be the uh, obvious sign of impermanence, that things pass away. Things are born, they have a lifespan and a death. If it's of the nature of being born, it's of the nature of dying. And so I just wanted to mention that as Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Zen teacher, uh, illustrating impermanence of his own physical body. And then this phrase, be free where you are. Thich Nhat Hanh was a master at uh, dropping these little phrases that summed up huge teachings. Be free where you are. And when we observe impermanence, it actually allows us to be free where we are. When we observe the ever-changing reality that we are born into, that we live in, this human body, 
this human experience on planet Earth. Everything's changing. Nothing stays the same. It is changing. And so we do these meditations to allow us to experience that viscerally. We experience it not only in our logical mind, because logically we know everything is changing. Even now we know that I can hold up this singing bowl, right? And I feel solid and fixed and permanent in my hand. But if I was to look at this bowl 500 years from now, it might be quite decayed. We know that the atoms and particles that are making up this are actually moving at rapid rates. And if we could look with a scientific instrument at the atoms in this pole, we would see that the atoms are made up of 99% empty space. And so we know that everything is moving, fluctuating, changing. We know that from studying science. And so we can contemplate that in the mind and say, yes, everything's changing, nothing stays the same, big deal. And we go on with our day. That doesn't do anything for us. It doesn't bring us into contact in our heart, in our body, with the law of impermanence. So we embrace these practices of impermanence so that we can be free where we are. And freedom implies freedom from something, right? So what does contemplating impermanence free us from? Well, it frees us from looking for permanent, solid, fixed ground in a world that has no permanent, solid, fixed ground. It frees us from seeking security in that way. And in fact, it frees us from seeking out happiness, permanent, lasting happiness in a world where nothing is permanent and lasting. And when we drop that pursuit, we're free to discover the joy and happiness where it is lasting and permanent, internally, in our heart, at least until this physical body passes away. Then who knows, maybe Maybe we find a lasting permanence happiness there. I don't know. It hasn't happened for me yet. So we reclaim the responsibility for our life. We reclaim this joy, this happiness. And that happens because we, we actually, we recognize now everything is changing, nothing stays the same. All of that energy that we used to use in the pursuit of happiness. I gotta get the new job, gotta get the new car, gotta buy this, gotta buy that, the new phone, the new watch, get that new relationship, meet that new person, go here, do that. We can stop that. And that's a tremendous amount of energy that we reclaim. And that energy can be used for insight. And this is why the meditation practice is quite important because it helps us to reclaim that energy and use it for insight. And in that practice of insight, we find that, oh, it's here. It's here all along. Good therapist, psychologist will tell you, 
nobody can make you feel anything. And they usually say that when they're, you know, addressing a person who said, oh, this person made me feel so angry, or this person made me feel so sad, or this situation made me feel so depressed. They'll, the therapist will say, oh, you know, that's your own feelings. The situation can't make you feel anyway, or a person can't make you feel anyway. And so take that a little bit further and you recognize that, oh, it's here. That, that person might help me remember. Beautiful. That situation, that impermanent situation passing might help me recall, oh, I am beautiful. I am joy. I am happiness. I am love. Oh. But it's here all along. And so when we rest into the experience of the ever change, we release the pursuit for that permanent, solid, fixed entity in the ever change, and we turn it in on ourself, we find joy. We find happiness there. We find reality. It's not always joy and happiness. We, we, we find what's, what's real for us. Now these practices can be challenging, I'm not going to lie. And so they're all there on video for you. Uh, I haven't put them on my website yet, but they're on YouTube, they're here on my Instagram uh, channel, they're also on my Facebook page. Start at the beginning, that's my recommendation. Spend two to three weeks on each one. The beginning one, the beginning chapter or video uh, will be where we meditate on starting with the planets, the stars, the galaxies, the celestial beings, bodies, planet Earth, all of our external experience. So as far as we can imagine, coming down to the moment-to-moment -moment change in the sounds of the present moment, change in, as the sun moves across the sky, the light changes in your room or outside, the traffic moving by, or change in the aural field. I really like that. So spend about two to three weeks there. And if you can, spend about a half an hour in that meditation every day. Then coming closer, meditating on change in the physical body. spending two to three weeks. And so we start with the present moment physical body. And we compare and contrast that to what our body felt like and looked like in our memory five years ago. And then 10 years ago. And then 15 years ago. Sometimes when I teach this one-on-one -on -one to, to students, they say, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't want to remember what my body was like when I was 20 years old. Other people are like, oh, I want, I want to be there. I want to, I want to remember and, and stay there. And right there is how we suffer. That clinging to what can't be held in place. The Buddha said, it will be hard for people to hear my teachings because human beings delight and revel in their place. It will be hard for people who delight and revel in their place to feel this ground, is how he put it. And 
And so these practices are allowing us to see that there is no place to delight and revel in. It frees us from that. Be free where you are. Take that on. There's no ground. So we spend two to three weeks contemplating change in the universe, the world, Mother Gaia. And we come into our own body, recognizing how much our body has changed from five-year-old us to present-day us. So that's about six weeks of meditation. Then the next three weeks, we practice with the I, our mental structure. We use the same five-year uh, increments. So we take our present-day values, beliefs, truths, ideas, take stock in our abilities to uh, see, think, smell, touch, feel. Compare that present-day <clears throat> to five years ago. And 10 years ago. 15 years ago. And so in doing this, now we start to feel a shift in what we considered to be a solid, fixed I. This thing we call our self. Because that thing that feels so permanent and fixed, this entity. Some people feel it behind the eyes here. Some people feel it in the chest or the abdomen. It's just another feeling. It's just another experience. And that too is also in the river of ever change. See, it's part of this illusion that we experience ourselves out here looking down at the world that's in this ever-changing field. We think we're this permanent observer looking down at an ever-changing world. That observer is in the river of ever-change. Because the observer, the, this experience of I, it fluctuates. It's based on memory, and memory is subjective. If you have siblings, you might talk to them and remember, oh, you remember that, that holiday we took together, and you know, X, Y, Z happened, and this happened, and that happened, and, th and their memory is totally different. And that's why siblings can grow up together and be so different than each other. Because their take on the experience that you shared is different. In fact, if you have that experience with a sibling, compare notes. See what happens if you're, you attempt to shift your memory to match their memory. See what happens in your feeling of being a self, an I. And you'll feel that I shift. And you might have had this experience if you grew up in a place and then you left that place when you were very young and then you return back to that place as an adult. Everything looks smaller, right? Everything is much closer together than it was. The school that you used to walk to that was just a block away, that seemed like, you know, an hour walk away. Now you recognize that it's just there, just a, a 10 minute walk. And this changes you, it changes who you thought you were. Because that I, that solid fixed, Permanent I is also in this ever-changing field. 
Now, we do the meditation on the external for three weeks, I recommend. Meditation on the change in the body for three weeks. Then meditation on change in the eye for three weeks, the internal. And then the next weeks you combine all three together. And then it's like you rest in this field of ever change that's changing on all levels. Now, it's not all changing all at the same time. The, the planets and stars, are you know, they take years and years and years and centuries and eons to change. Yet my, my hair, for example, I have to shave once a week. And uh, you know the, the seasons change every few months. The aural field changes second by second. So this ever-changing river is flowing at different tempos, different currents, but it's all flowing, it's all changing. There's not one experience that you can point to and say, that's permanent. Now this can feel disorienting sometimes because we're actually learning to experience reality in a different way than what we're used to. But this isn't the first time that humans have had to do that. I like the example of Copernicus who pointed out through uh, telescopes that the sun was rotating I'm sorry, that the Earth was rotating around the Sun before Copernicus's theory uh, and proof. They, human beings, used to think that uh, the uh, Sun rotated around the Earth. And indeed, it looks that way to our nervous system. It feels that way. When we look out at the horizon, we see the Sun setting on the Earth's horizon. But we know that it's not. We know that the Earth is setting on the sun's horizon. And just in that same way, it feels to us, to our nervous system, to the human nervous system, that we are a solid fixed entity looking out at a world out there. That we can control and move and fix into permanent entities. It looks like that. It feels like that. We want it to be that way. And in fact, there are many evolutionary psychologists who agree that that happened as a survival strategy for the human being, for the species. That we needed to separate from nature and f experience ourselves as this I looking out at an other world out there so that we could survive. We don't need to do that anymore. We can survive without that separation. We can reclaim the unity inherent in the world. Be free where you are. So I was mentioning that these practices can feel a little disorienting. If fear arises during any stage of this meditation practice or anger or any sort of emotional arises, the task then is to hold the emotion and feel it. Because emotions too are arising and passing. Emotions are in that field of ever change. Now, interestingly enough, when we get angry, right? For example, uh, we take that emotion out of the field of ever change. And then we don't just look at it, but we start thinking, our mind starts to go telling stories 
oh, I can't believe this person said that and this and that, and I should see this and I should do that, and next time I talk to that person, I'm going to punch him in the jaw. All of those stories, all of that mental chatter keeps the emotion in place. So we take the visualization, everything's in this river, and we then we, we experience something, some experience that is also a part of that ever-change, as we are a part of this ever-changing river. We have this experience that, for whatever reason, triggers anger in us. We take the anger out of that river of ever-change, the mind starts to run with it. Fixes it into a solid, fixed entity. It fixes the anger. And once that is solid and fixed, we become a solid and fixed I. It gives us something to struggle against. It makes us feel alive, permanent, fixed, an entity. An I here struggling against an object out there. We could be struggling against the anger itself. Oh, I don't want to feel this. I shouldn't feel anger. I'm a spiritual person. I meditate all day and I don't want to get angry. Angry is for bad people. <laughs> that leads to repression. That's not good. The, the feel the emotion and let it go. By let it go, we don't push it away. I, when I say let it go, I mean let it be. Allow the thoughts to subside. Allow the emotion to return back into that river of ever change. And when you do that, if your mind is still, you'll feel the I also return back to that river of ever change. Because the experience of I only makes sense in relationship to an experience of other. And so that's why, if, you know, to, to, um, to many people, it feels good uh, to have strong emotions. They feel alive. And I've heard this from people uh, from certain cultures, like Latin America, for example. They, they, they take up meditation, they say, oh, I'm, I, I don't want to meditate because I'm afraid I'll lose this aliveness. It's actually not, that doesn't happen. You actually feel more alive through meditation practice. But we, we don't attach to the emotions. We feel the emotion when it arises, and we actually feel it much more vividly, but we just don't attach to it. Because the words actually cloud the experience of the emotion. The words in our mind are thoughts. So we let those thoughts go, the emotion goes back into the river of ever change. Now, why is that so important? Well, it's relieving uh, if you're experiencing sadness or grief or anger or any emotion that you, you uh, find unpleasant because you say, well, that's, I can let that go. I don't need to feel that. That's just going back to the river of ever change as is the experience which triggered that emotion will also go back to the river of ever change. So it can be relieving in that way. Also, emotions, uh, when we're triggered, uh, we can't serve the present moment. We're then uh, serving the present moment, perhaps, as we wish the present moment were. We're meeting that present moment, uh, seeing the present moment through the lens of preference and prejudice. So, we're not meeting what's arising, we're meeting what's arising plus what we wish was there as well. So these practices of impermanence allow that to wash through us. Again, not repressing anything. We see our preferences and prejudices arise and we let them go and then we meet the present moment head on. We embrace exactly what's arising rather than what's arising seen through the lens of what we wish was.
funny. I, I sometimes when I when I uh, create these episodes, I, I uh, you know write out some things, some some talking points uh, uh, that I might like to touch on, and then I just go. <laughs> Uh, and that seems to be happening a, a lot today, and I'm fine with that. I hope you are too. Hmm. So when we embrace this field of ever change, or when we embrace the reality of impermanence, we are born into this world that is ever changing. This permanent I, which we have also discovered is in that field of ever change. We are allowed to be free. We reclaim responsibility for our own happiness and joy. We stop the pursuit. We also recognize that experiences are all passing moving to other experiences. It's this ever-flowing change of fluctuating experience. So we don't need to fixate on this is good, this is bad. And when we do fixate, we take it out of the river of ever-change. And that's really quite ironic when you think about it, right? Especially if it's something we're struggling against, because the best thing, if we're struggling against something, is to allow that to pass, right? Then we can be freed from that. So in our desire to be free from an experience, we push against it, which in fact keeps the experience in play. <laughs> How silly. So these practices allow us to find that rest in the river of ever change so that we trust that arising and passing and so i think that's all i'm going to talk about today i'm going to return back to the tre retreat here at new life foundation it is our final retreat before we close the doors for a while. Another beautiful lesson of impermanence. I usually now would uh, talk about what my next offering on Facebook Live will be and on Instagram, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I will talk about. I will probably be back on, uh, I guess, Friday morning here in Asia, Thursday evening in the States. Uh, but I'm not sure yet what I'm, what I'm going to offer. So if, I, if there are any requests, I take requests. Uh, if there's any topic uh, that you'd like for me to address, I'd be happy to do that, or at least entertain any ideas. Uh, so, in any case, I will see you all uh, Thursday evening or Friday morning, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, if you have any comments or questions about impermanence, non-self, or any of the topics that I've talked about in any Facebook Live sessions, if you have any questions about meditation, always feel free to send those along. Happy to address any questions that come my way. Please do stay safe, stay clean, stay healthy, whatever that means for you. And take heart. If you're really in, you know, feeling stress from the COVID crisis, perhaps you've been locked in isolation for quite some time, this will change. This is another experience that's in that river of ever change. Or if you're in a country that's divided by politics, that's burning through forest fires, 
that's being seared by climate change or feeling uh, the weight of storms through climate change. This is all a part of the ever change. The Grand Canyon was created through climate change. Now I'm not saying that we should encourage that type of activity or event. I'm saying that everything is changing. And change now creates an ending which gives birth to a new beginning, which brings an ending, which gives birth to a new beginning, which brings an ending, which gives birth to a new beginning, which brings an ending, which brings birth to a new beginning.